Now, you know, tonight I want to talk to you about agreement. And I really pray that, you know, as you hear God's word, it's going to be something that you could apply in your life or something that you could do in your life. You know, um, knowledge can't really do anything for us if it's not knowledge that we're going to experience. And God wants you to have a real relationship with him. It means God wants you to experience him. And I want to let you know when you come to church, it's not that we can learn more or understand more. It's so that we can have a greater experience of God. And I want to encourage you to let that be your desire, that you want to experience God more and more daily. And you want to walk in a real living relationship with God because everything else is dead religion. So I want to talk to you today about agreement. And I believe when you get it, you're going to see how you can really live life based on or experience in God's best. So I want you to really listen to it today, and I really pray that God will bless you from it. So I'm going to jump right into it. Um, give me Amos chapter 3, verse 3. I feel you have to drop me slightly, but give me um, Amos chapter 3, verse 3. And in the book of Amos, the prophet, God says, can two walk together? What do I give me that in the King James Version? You know? If you want to know what is the main version of Bible that I read, I use the King James as my standard. And then I look at other versions that maybe will elaborate or bring more clarity. And the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And that's such a true statement. And today we're going to talk about agreement. And there is Lynn there. And how many of y'all remember the day when Lynn um, came down the aisle and held her um, husband's hand, or uh, was her husband-to-be hand, and they got married? And then they both walked out together as husband and wife. One. That was just awesome. And I prayed for Lynn. And I prayed for... And when I was praying for Lynn, I don't know if it was my imagination, but she seemed to be getting really light. You know, like if she was going to fall because of the um, trauma of the Dana. And I was thinking, no, don't let this be the bride that falls over the girl while you prayed for her. You know, I think she was overcome by the day. You know, and since then... She's gotten married, and she's with a husband. And can I tell you what is the biggest challenge in marriage? Anybody knows? Agreement. You know, because two cannot walk together unless they agree. Have you ever had a disagreement with your husband, Lynn? <laughs> I normally turns out, it could turn out good, or it could turn out... Some people handle disagreement, you know, differently. You know, some people they argue, some people get quiet, some people lick your dung, right? <laughs> you know, it could be a different way people respond to disagreement. But the Bible tells us, how can two walk together except they agree? You know, I remember, um, and I remember we were in a church and we were preaching a message on repentance. And the message had finished. And as I was handing over the mic to the pastor's wife in the church, I heard God's voice, and he said this to me. He said, I am he that walketh in the midst of the candlesticks. And when I heard that word, it was so real in my spirit at the time that I actually grabbed back the mic from the pastor's wife. Because it was so, this word was in my spirit. And I made this statement, and I said, well, come walk Jesus. And when I said that, something beautiful happened in the place the presence of God filled this church, and I saw all over the church little pockets breaking out of people weeping and crying. People were slain on the ground, and it was just, we had this 15 to 20 minutes of what a supernatural, and it was such an awesome and a reverent time that when the pastor's wife took back the mic, she made everybody come up in the front of the church, and they all kneeled down, and they sort of rededicated their lives to God because there was an undeniable fact that God sovereignly visited us that day, the presence of God. I remember I had a dream several years ago of right here on the street, and we were setting up for a prayer meeting. And, you know, I, I don't know, you know what was going to happen in the prayer meeting. But as I looked in the dream and I walked to the back of the building, how many remember those days when you used to have service in the back right here? Anybody remember those days? We were mad. <laughs> you know, we put a stage right here. Oh, this was outside, eh, for those of you who don't know. We put a stage right here and we bring lights 
and we will be rocking out Woodbrook with worship songs. I don't know, police didn't lock us up, you know. We were, we were just crazy, like if heaven on earth, uh, you know what I mean? Like if all the lords and the Lord was, you know, we were mad, but it was an awesome time, and we'd be worshiping and stuff like that. Well, in this dream, I walked to the back of the building, and there was this high stage. And when I saw the stage and I walked on the stage, I immediately began to see four points in this compound, four gates. And there were people, like a crowd, pressing into all the gates. And it was so thick that I was wondering where all these people were coming from. And then it was packed to the max. And I stood up there um, on the stage, and for that moment, I felt inadequate because there were so many people there. And I said to myself, I didn't know so many people were interested in prayer because it was a prayer meeting. And my first thought was to call a young lady, I don't know if you all know her, her name is Crystal Chung, because she was like a real prayer warrior. When she prayed, you felt like if heaven came down. And my first thought was to call her to pray now, because I felt really inadequate, so I turned to a 16-year-old. Um, so, and then after, um, I be, a thought came into my mind about God walking with Adam in the cool of the day. And that thought filled my being on that stage so much that I began to sing a song. And I can't sing. But I began to sing a song, Walk Me Jesus, Walk Me Jesus. And the song began to fill the air and it was so beautiful that I began to sing out louder to hear myself because it's like the first time in my life I'm hearing myself singing and I'm singing like Ryan. I don't know if you, you know what I mean? I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. I'm going, walk me Jesus, walk me Jesus. And I'm singing a song, you know, and the atmosphere, it was just awesome. And I came up, came out of the dream. And you see, walking together represents an intimate fellowship with God. That's what walking together is. That's God's plan for us. The Bible says when God made Adam and Eve, he'd walk with them in the cool of the day. And the Bible says, how can two walk together except they agree? That it's God's desire that heaven and earth would come in agreement. That his will will be done on the earth. And God wants you to come in agreement with heaven. And he wants to be able to walk with you. But you see, you know, just like life, when you walk with someone, you're going to come to agreement eventually. And that's where the Bible says this. Give me this verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Here what the Bible says. Be not unequally tied up, you know, or yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness? And the word fellowship there really speaks about walking together in a place of agreement. That's what the word fellowship speaks of. So it says, what fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness? Or what communion had light with darkness? Look at the next verse. And what agreement or concord? Give me that in the NIV version, please. Here it says. And what harmony is there between Christ and Baal? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Look at the next verse. And what agreement is there between the temple of God and of idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And God says, I will live with them and I'll walk among them. And I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Look at the next verse. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I would receive you. And you can walk in agreement with God and in agreement with sin. That, and I know the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Who's your real main stay or your real, you know, your real horse? Who's, your, who's that punch, punch or, you know, that real line? Who's, who's your um, tonto? You know, who's the person that you lineman with right through in your life? Is your horse, is the person you call a horse um, an unbeliever? Something's going to affect your life. Do you know the number one, some people think they fight Satan with horns. 
But I tell you, you have to be more careful about Satan's two-legged helpers. You have to be more careful about people in your life that are sent by Satan on a mission. You ever had people who were there for you just when you didn't need them the most? <laughs> Anybody ever had people like that in your life? They were there for you just when you didn't need them the most. Just when you were at your weakest moment, they said to you, Gil, let me go and take a drink. Yes, Gil? Sometimes you have to, you know, hey boy, we get pay, boy. What are you doing to your money, boy? Boy, let me go and buy something to smoke, boy. And just when uh, you didn't need them, they brought you to a place where you go, went further from God in your life. Can I ask you a question? Can a guy's girlfriend, a guy who loves the Lord, can his, can his girlfriend be an unbeliever? Can I ever work out? Can, if you love the Lord, can your girlfriend be an unbeliever? Hey, I became a Christian at the age of 17. And my girlfriend was an unbeliever. We would go parties Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If I, when, we reach, when I reach up and reach on a party, the fellas, the crowd, my crew, Lyman crew, they used to start a count. One, two, three, four. And if she didn't show up in 10 seconds, they'd say, well, I'm cool. And all they fall out or something. Uh, you know, I was like that, right? And so we were close. But when I gave my life to Christ, how can two walk together except they agree? Because here came Friday night, and the church had a service. And I say, I want to go to church Friday night. I want to go to church Friday night. And she would say, I want to go Anchorage Friday night. And it was kind of rough. And you know what is the sad thing? I have to tell you all that I tried the Anchorage because of her. You know, so I went to Anchorage, you know what I mean? Until I went to my last Anchorage. And I realized there was nothing here for me. So you're either going to be in agreement with God or in agreement with friends who don't love God. You all remember Alberto came to the Lord? Brought this young lady with him, a beautiful young lady. You know? Um, um, she came with him. You know? And Alberto was there. And, you know, it's sad when people get saved and they bring their girlfriend hoping she gets saved. You know, that's always sad. You know, and the girlfriend gives her life to the Lord, but the real reason why she's given her life to the Lord, because she knows that's what the guy wants. And that's why the Bible tells you, how can two walk together except they agree? How many of you want to walk with God? How many of you want to walk with God in your life? How many of you want a real, living, intimate relationship with God in your life? How many of you want to say, I want to walk with him like Adam walks with God? I want to walk with God like Adam walked in the garden. I'm so excited about my walk with God because that's what I'm called to do. Have a real walk with God. I'm excited about it. I want Jesus to be the God that walks in the midst of the candlesticks. I want Jesus to walk in the midst of this church. But how could two walk together except they agree? And that's why the Bible tells us, I want to walk among you. I want to be your God and you'd be my people, but I have a requirement. You must come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. You know, some people make it look like you can have fellowship with God and you can walk with God and walk in sin. They make it look like God is going to hang out with you and you say, Jesus, what are you doing today, Jesus? I thought we'd just go and fed down the place, you know. You can't be in agreement with sin and in agreement with God. Some people preach today that you don't need to repent. And God will receive you if you don't repent. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying what? Come out from among them and be what? Separate and touch no what? Unclean thing. Then I'll receive you. You see, you can't walk together with God and be in agreement with the world. You have to repent and come out of the world. Don't let anyone fool you. Don't let anyone deceive you. You can claim to know God and walk in a real relationship with God. But God is love. And for you to be in agreement with God and to walk with God, you must be in a relationship with love. You, you agree with me? And that's a big challenge of life, right? To be in agreement. And how many of you want to have a closer walk with God? How many of you want to have a closer intimate walk with God? That's living life based on agreement with heaven. That's what God wants us to do. You don't live a holy life by your own strength. But when you repent and you turn to God, he releases the grace of God so you can live a holy life. You have to be ready for Jesus' return. 
And we have such a great example in the man Enoch who walked with God and God took him. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they agree? And God wants you to walk in agreement with him. I hope, I pray, I really desire that we can be together. This camp is packed out, right? This is going to be our biggest camp. There's already 60-something people in the camp, so if you're not there, make sure. What an awesome thing it would be if while we're in the camp, we all could just go out. When I be an awesome thing, while we're in the camp, all of us just go on up to be with the Lord. But would it be a sad thing that while we're in the camp, everybody going up, one of us here in a carnival fete, Yes? Wouldn't that be a sad thing? Daniel in a speedo. With a staff. Right? Daniel in a speedo with a staff. In a carnival fete. Right? Jungle, playing jungle mass. Right? Playing jungle mass. And he going, whine on this, whine on that, whine on this, whine on that. And while he whining on this and whining on that, he hearing preachers saying to him, Daniel, it's okay. If you sin, don't worry about it. You're righteous, you're righteous. And he going on whining, you're righteous, you're righteous. And he going, you know, you're righteous. And BAM! You think when they clap like that, you studying false preachers? If you hear that clap, you think at that moment you study false preachers? You know what the man said when he came out of the dream? He's a, he was a Christian serving the Lord after that, right? He was now born again, serving the Lord. He said when he came out of that dream, he fell on and he said, God, forgive me. God, I repent. He said he didn't cry out for his wife. He didn't cry out for his children. He didn't cry out for nobody. He said all he was thinking about was himself. And you see, that day, every one of us will give an account for our own self. You may study in that person and that person and this one and what this one do and what this one say. You're going to be studying yourself. And you'll have to stand before God. Daniel, don't do that, of course. <laughs> right? Because I think if you do it, you can, you can cause the whole carnival to cancel. <laughs> you know? You blank carnival. Carnival end. <laughs> they say, how oh, carnival end? Daniel, walk out and ban shut down. You know? So don't do that. Daniel is going to be in camp with us worshiping the Lord. You know? And that is what that is what God wants us to come out. Now listen to me. Are you saying Kerwin if I go, I serve the Lord and if I go carnival day, are you saying I'm not going to heaven? Listen to me. I do not know. I still trying to make sure I go to heaven. <laughs> You know, I can't figure out your business for you. You had to know in your heart. You know, you don't know if I go into heaven or not. It's only when Jesus comes and say, but he make it, boy. He make it. You don't know if I go in home, I beating my wife or she beating me. You know, you don't know what's going on. Because you know she's stronger than me. You know, you don't know what is going on in somebody's heart. That's why the Bible says, that's why the Bible says, encourage one another while it's called today. Every day, encourage each other that you do not sin, lest you have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The Bible tells me not to encourage you that sin is no big deal every day. But the Bible tells me every day, while it's called today, encourage one another. Why? I don't know how long it takes for your heart to become hardened. I don't know how long it takes. I'm not trying to figure it out. I'm not a heart-hardening scientist. I don't know how long. I just know your heart don't just get hard. Your heart gets hard through what? So I don't have to go around and preach about hard, 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 hard. God, don't want hard, hard, hard. I come to tell you about hard, hard. No, I come to tell you about sin. Because the Bible says the road to a hard heart is paved in sin. So the Bible says to warn each other and encourage each other and caution each other while it's called today. That's every day. That your heart will not be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How much more as we expect our Lord to burst the skies at any moment that we are this end time generation. That you're supposed to be saying to your brother, hey bro, watch my eyes. You're free from porn, bro? Watch me. Bro, you're doing that? Watch me. Bro, gosh, God, repent from that. God will forgive you. 
Watch your brother. Watch Tevin. He said, Tevin, watch him straight in the eyes. He's laughing at people. Watch him straight in the eyes. And he said, Tevin, that red girl he was interested in some time ago. You know? That, you, st- you have spoke to her recently? And he said, you watch him in the eyes. You watch your brother in the eyes. And see if his eyes start to bat. See if his eyes. You have a partner. You come in here. You have a, this, you know, um, this, they both, this, this couple here got married recently. Yes? Yes? Can you give them a round of applause? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? They're legal. Amen? They're legal. It's great to be legal, you know? But they were coming before, and Alberto was close to them. Alberto called his partner and said, bro, watch me in my face. You're dealing with that girl, bro? Watch me. You're dealing with that girl? That's why you need some real friends. You need some real friends who go watch you and ask you and encourage you, not condemn you, and say, bro, you can't deal with that girl unless you're married to her, no? And he said, all right, okay, I realize. I'll marry her. That's a real friend, you know? Hey, you have a, some lip on films home? Come on, get rid of that. We must encourage each other while it's called today. Strengthen each other. Is there any sin that God can't forgive? Is there any sin? No, God will forgive anything. So whatever is this situation, you go to your brother and say, bro, I want to encourage you. I just perceive by the Spirit of God that, man, you're into covetousness right now. You think getting rich is it. You're making it an idol. Money, 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 money. Serve God. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and mammon. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll add money to you. He'll add honey to you. Serve God. And you can go to your brother and you can speak to him the truth of God's word. That you can encourage each other. Man, we are a family that loves God, and we hate sin. Why we hate sin? Because sin is not love. Watching a girl and saying, why not this advantage it, broke it, all kind of things they're saying. I even know what it means, right? If it's something bad, I apologize, right? <laughs> but it's evil. It is not good, right? You can't watch your sister and say that to her. So you know that is not... <laughs> you know, you know that is not love. You know that. Anybody here don't know carnival is not love? Anybody here, when they went behind a girl carnival day, they see a girl in a crown and went behind her. In your heart, you were filled with love to her? Anybody? Be honest. Sir. You know what's going to be the big sin that people are going to realize come judgment day? You know what's the first sin God judged in the church? Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. And the sin God is going to judge on judgment day is the sin of lying to the Holy Spirit. That's why he did that first, as an example to the church. The church was so holy, it was so perfect, without spot. They were in one accord, they loved each other so much, and they gave to each other, and they had all things in common, and the church was just Jesus' bride. And then came a couple in the church, and their heart was not right, and they heard a man give a big offering, and they came and sold a house for $2 million. And come to the church and say, we give one million dollars to the church. Like if God would be happy and if God need your money. And when they rest their hundred, they give one million dollars to the church. The apostle Peter watched them and said, how much did you sell the house for? He said, one million. He said, was not the money yours to do whatever you want? Why did you come in this house? And he says, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to the Holy Ghost. And he fell long dead. And then his wife came and he said, how much you always sell your house for? She said, one million dollars. He said, have you conspired to lie? They didn't even get to spend the money they keep. They didn't even get to spend. And on judgment day, when Christ returns, you're going to realize he's the God that searches the hearts. And deep down in your heart, you're going to realize that the Holy Spirit was speaking to you deep down in your heart and said, my child, what you're doing is wrong. You didn't need a pastor to tell you. You didn't need a church to tell you. You didn't need a pastor. But the Spirit of God was poured out on all flesh that deep down in your heart, God loved you so much, He gave you the Spirit of truth. So that when you walked in and believed a lie, you lied to the Holy Ghost. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And that's where God wants us to bring our life to. Where Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. And we begin to live our lives based on the Lordship of Jesus. It's not a prayer that you make to give your life to Christ. But it's a daily walk 
of every day saying, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Father, I like to cuss up that man, but not my will, but your will be done. Father, I like to run on that woman, but not my will, but thy will be done. Father, and you begin to walk in that dimension where you, you anytime your will meets the will of God and it contradicts each other, you bear your cross and you follow Jesus. That's what it is where Christ has called us to walk in agreement with him. How can two walk together except they agree? God is never going to agree with your sin. He's never going to agree. So somebody has to repent and it ain't God. God is never going to agree with your sin. Somebody has to repent and it ain't God. Preachers today are preaching that God repent. They make it look like God changed your mind on sin. He changed and said sin wasn't so bad all along. My son Jesus was just beat up for no reason. But I want to let you know that the Bible says it's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of the living God. It's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And I want you to know that Christians, people who call themselves Christians, who love God and love the world and have become lukewarm, they face a greater judgment when Jesus comes back. He says, I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Because the Bible says, to he who much is given, much is required. And to he that knows to do right and does not do it shall be beaten with many stripes. And he that does not know to do right and does wrong shall be beaten with few stripes. It's better if somebody was cold and they got few stripes than they were lukewarm and got beaten with many stripes. You have to serve God from your heart. And serving from God from your heart is a heart condition. It's a heart that says, God, you're my Lord. Your will is mine to do. Jesus said it this way. And people think that he's joking. And people have abandoned the words of Jesus. But this is what my Lord tells me. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? And many in that day shall say to me, Lord, Lord. But not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the what? Will of God. You know what the Bible says? Give me this verse in the Bible. Give me Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Matthew 16, verse 24. You know what the Bible says? Matthew 16, verse... And Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man cometh after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And I want to let you know, that's a real Christian walk. Listen to me carefully. If any man comes after me, Jesus says, let him what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and what? Follow me. What it is to deny yourself. It is to find your identity in Jesus. To deny yourself means you put your old man to death in Christ so that you can find your life in Jesus. It's a practical walk. I think the best man that said it, because people preach now that you don't have to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Imagine Jesus tells me, if any man comes after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. And a man there says that you don't have to take up your cross and follow Jesus, and people entertain that. I tell you, you're going to have to drink this cup to follow those preachers. You're going to have to drink the cup of denying Jesus and his words. And I caution you and I warn you of the wisdom of Jude as he writes that we ought to contend for the faith in these end times because he said men came and turned the grace of God into lasciviousness even the point, even to the point of denying our Lord. You watch out from those men who deny the words of Jesus and say Jesus was not speaking to you. Jesus says if any man comes after me let him deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. And I want you to know that's what a real Christian life looks like. The Christian life is a life of denying yourself. Denying yourself means to put to death your old man so that you can walk in the newness of who Christ has said you are. And it's a practical living. I think, and we live it out every day. You see a girl that is attractive and is beautiful and yourself it means your carnal self your fleshly self says that girl look at her lust after watch her and denying yourself says lord i want to do this but your word says this and where your will of god 
crosses the will. Where your will crosses the will of God, you've now met your cross. Listen to me. Where your will meets the will of God, you've now met your cross. And denying yourself, say, Father, not my will, but your will be done. The question I'll ask you, is Jesus your Lord? The question I ask you, not if you said a sinner's prayer and you gave your life to Jesus. You know, many times people say a sinner's prayer and they give their life to Jesus. It's a great start. But that's like coming to an aisle and saying, I do, I do. And you're now married and you left the place and you never said hello to your wife again. Marriage is only a covenant. But after you get married, then you're going to have to walk out the covenant daily. And the Bible says, how can two walk together except they agree? I don't know about you, but God thinks that you have to agree with him. And that's why the words of Jesus is, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the what? Will of God. And that is taking up your cross daily and following Jesus. You say, what if I don't take up my cross daily? What if I don't take it up daily? You'll get further and, away from, further, and further away from the life of God in your life. And I have to do that daily in my life. And it's not just with sin. It has to be agreeing with the gospel, agreeing with the cross. And you have to live your life where you agree with the finished work of Jesus. So if there is sickness in your body and everything is saying to you you're sick and you're diseased and something is wrong with you, you have to say, Father, you said I'm healed, but yet my body says I'm sick. I choose to take up my cross and follow you. Not my will, but your will be done. Father, my body is sane, and my desires are sane. You're a fornicator, you're a luster, you're a homosexual, you're a lesbian, but you call me the child of God. I choose to deny myself and follow you. That's what denying yourself is about. It's about finding your identity in Jesus. It's about finding your identity in Christ. It is refusing to find your identity in the old man, but you begin to live in the fullness of who Jesus is in your life. And therefore, if your old man says you're a sinner, you begin to deny yourself and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. If your old man says you're going to walk in this old ways, no, you say, I'm a new creature in Christ. And I don't know about you. I think the Apostle Paul said it best in the word of God when he said, I die daily. What a statement. Some people think they have more wisdom than the Apostle Paul. They think they have more understanding of the word of God than the Apostle Paul. But he in his wisdom says, in my walk with God, I die daily. And I want to let you know, as you walk with God, you're going to have to die daily. So that you'll do what the Apostle Paul says. That I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. That I may be made conformable to his death. And that's what you want in your life. You want to come to a place where your old man is dead in Christ so that you can live out this beautiful and awesome life that Jesus has purchased for us in him. And you're going to walk that way in your life. You have to walk that way in your life. Where, you, where you, Everybody can understand how you walk that way practically in your life. You all, you all seen it, how you do it practically in your life. Every day, every day. Just I'm echoing now and I'm, I got, a, got louder or something. Every day in your life, you have to make a decision. Somebody... How many of you know parents could send you? Yes? Anybody have some parents who send you? I'm echoing a lot, guys. How many of you know parents could send you? Uh, you know? Especially when they get older. They could send you. Anybody knows? Yes? I went by Onika, by her grandmother. Right? I there with Onika, um, Dominic, with her grandmother. I'm in the room with Onika. And I say, you know, let me put myself out of the way. And let me go and spend time with Onika's family. It's her grandmother. And let me go and spend time and stuff like that. Onika leave the room and leave me. And she go on lining. So it's now me alone with her grandmother. And her grandmother is, um, what is it called when your memory starts to go a bit? Or your, you know? She said to me, boy, it's a long time I ain't see you. I said, yeah, you saw me the other day. You know, until we talked for a while. After about five minutes, she said, boy, it's a long time I ain't see you, boy. I say, yeah, you were here so many other days, you know what I mean? Think. After another five minutes, when last I see you? I say, all right, just to get it. And then we watching a video on Israel and Jerusalem and stuff on TBN. And she said, you know, I was to go and live there, but it just didn't, you know, pan out, you know? I say, okay, right. Another five minutes passed. She said, 
you know I was to go and live there. And she gave me a little more information. So I said, wow, you know, I think. After I lived a few minutes, she said, you know I was to go and live there. I said, way. I said, I said, I'm going to get something and come back. I'm coming back. And as I go in, she said, it's a long time I ain't see you. Eh? I call outside. When you get in the kitchen, Lyman, I say, so that is your big plan, eh? That is your big plan, you know? And sometimes, you know, people can get you on their nerves. Anybody has anybody who right now gets them on their nerves? Yes? Can you think of somebody? Your mother, your brother, your sister, somebody? At that point, you say what? You are, and now when somebody gets you on their nerves, right, you're going to react to them a certain way. Not so? When you get them on your nerves, you could tell them, look! And you can be mad. Or you can react to them with showing them what? Love. How many of you think you ever got God on his nerves? Yeah? How many of you think if God had gray hair, you will pull it out, right? And now, you have to react to that person in love. That's called what? Dying what? Daily. Anybody ever cuss your back and you wanted to cuss them back? You ever wanted to give somebody a piece of their ma- your mind? Yeah? A man, if I walked around giving everybody a piece of my mind, I'll have no mind. So I made a decision that I want to love the way God loves. That is what it is to take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. And I want to let you know, let no one fool you, that Christianity is a daily walk with God. And when you live that way, here's the, here's, here's the reward. Here's the reward. When you live that way, here's the reward. Hear what the Apostle Paul says, that I may know him. That I may know him. By putting off the old man and putting on the new man. That I may know all of his love. I may know who I am in Christ. That I may know all of his grace and his mercy and his kindness to me by believing how he's loved me. I think no verse says it best in the Bible than this verse. Let's just go to that verse for a second. Could you give me um, Philemon chapter, Philemon verse 6. Here it says, Philemon, Philemon like the steak, verse 6. It says, that the communication of your faith may become effectual by acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Just point to your neighbor and say, there's some re- something real good in you. Just tell your neighbor that. You have something real good in you. And tell them it ain't, it ain't VAT 19. Just tell them that. There's something real good in you. And you have something, you have the best thing in you. You have the, watch me, you have the best in you. You know who's in you? Christ is in you. Just tell your neighbor that. Tell Jesus is in you. Jesus is in you. Wow, that's so awesome. Right? And how you get your faith to work? How do you get your faith to work? By what? The communication of your faith may become what? Effectual by what? Acknowledging. Every good thing in you. You have anybody around you that likes to acknowledge every bad thing in you? You have anybody around you that likes to point out everything bad you do? You're no good. You wait. Hope you're not thinking you, husband. <laughs> you're, uh, <laughs> you're not good. You're a waste of time. You're this. You're that. You know. You have a. Uh, you know. You have anybody? No, I should, bro. We get quiet now. Watch out. <laughs> no, just kidding. You know. You have, sometimes the people closest to you who should love you the most hurt you the most. How many of y'all know that? Right? Somebody who is supposed to love you the most has the potential to what? Hurt you the most. And that's why there's no way you can build a marriage without unconditional love. And when you realize your spouse does not love you, that's when you can really love them. When you realize somebody does not love you, and you ask them, you come home and you say, Honey, I'm real hungry. You could make a little dinner. Go and fix your phone food for yourself. You feel like you're a slave? You feel like you're a slave in this house? You know? I wouldn't put the other word that there's put with it. There's power word before, but, you know, it's an N-word, and people don't like that word anymore, so, you know? Um, you feel like you're a slave, you know? And you realize you're hungry and you're holding your belly, you know? Brother, I know you do all the cooking in the house. I know that, you know? Um, at that point, you have to make a decision to love that person, what? Unconditionally. Yeah, that's when the love of Christ is flowing from you. So when you can love somebody unconditionally. But hear what the Bible says. That the communication of your faith may become effectual by acknowledging every good thing 
that is in you by Christ Jesus. Why don't you try that with me for a second? Say, I'm healed. Say, I agree with Jesus that I'm healed. I agree with Jesus that I'm righteous. I agree with Jesus that I'm holy. I agree with Jesus that I'm a child of God. That is what it is to take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. Now, people have had the wrong view of repentance because of religion. Because people grow up in religion, they think repentance is penance. And they have a thinking in Christianity today that they want to be made conformable to their own debt instead of being made conformable to Christ's debt. And that's why the Bible tells us that we want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, in the power of his resurrection, that we, may, might, we might be made conformable to who? Jesus is dead. Or the Bible tells us the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of what? Strongholds. The casting down of what? Imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to what? The obedience of Christ. Bring the thoughts to the obedience of Christ. And so people have a wrong understanding of what it is to, to fight spiritual warfare and bring in the thoughts to the obedience of Jesus, or they have a wrong understanding of being made conformable to Christ's death. And that comes from religion. Some of you all may have grown up in Catholicism when you went for confessions and you did your sins, and the priest said, go and say an act of penance. And you see it a lot in the Pentecostal circles, that people would think when they're praying for, to God, they must go down on their knees and they must feel the pain. And when their knees are hurting and the rigor mortis setting, they say, God... You hear me, God. And they feel after fast. And when their belly gripe, they feel when the belly gripe, now is the time to pray. You know? And what that is, is unbelief in what Jesus has done. That's you thinking you have to suffer for your own sins. That's you not believing, in, not conforming to the sufferings of Christ. But it's such an intimate walk with Jesus. When this world comes and tells you, you're a luster, you're a pervert. And you go to Jesus and say, the world tells me I'm a luster pervert. What do you say, Jesus? And Jesus says, I see you as my beautiful bride, holy, without spot and blemish. And you say, God, I choose to walk with you. Because how can two walk together except they agree? Don't hold hands with the devil and walk with him. Don't walk down the aisle with Jesus and leave with Satan. Don't hold hands with the... You will agree with Satan? You would agree, I know God as a waste of time, as a whiner girl, as a whiner boy, snake oil in my waist, you have that kind of crazy mentality. As a lust, as a fat, as a womanizer, as a homosexual, as a lesbian, I have a battle, I have a battle. No! If you, if, you, if, if you don't understand that you don't solve life's problems by trying to fix it, I have a battle. You have a battle in your mind. I have a battle, I have a struggle, boy. I have a struggle, I have a struggle. No, in your mind. And you only overcome that battle through faith. And your faith is going to become effective when you acknowledge how Jesus has loved you. Why not walk with God? I tell you, to hold God's hands is the most beautiful hands you'll ever hold in your life. To have Jesus whispering in your ear, Oh boy! You want to hear sweet talk? You want to hear sweet talk like you never heard it before? Hold Jesus' hands and take a walk with him on the beach. And he would say, you're my, you're my precious daughter. I love you so much. Have you not heard I gave up everything for you? I was, I taught it not robbery to be equal with God. Sitting on the right hand of the Father, I became a man for you. I gave up all of the glory of heaven. But much more than that, I died a brutal death. I was dragged and beat up and mashed up because I love you. And you allow Jesus to speak over your life and declare who he is in you. And allow him to acknowledge every good thing in you. And you're going to find that you're going to have a real walk with God in your life. Day by day, when Satan challenges, challenges you and Satan says to you, come walk with me. You'd say, hey, to walk with you, I've got to let go the hand of my Lord. Because he's going a different path from you. And I choose to stay on that straight and narrow path. Because that's the only path that leads to eternity with Jesus. And I want to encourage you in your life tonight to walk with God. 
to walk in an intimate, real relationship with him where you will know him. And God will take you. He will snatch you up and you'll be his bride forever. You'll be a child of God forever. You'll be a daughter of God forever. Let me close with this last verse. Give me Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Here it says. How many of you think you're understanding this? How many of you this is giving you a perspective to walk out daily in your life? You know what the Bible says? You know, you've got to make your faith effective by agreeing with heaven. And who heaven says you are. And believing that Christ is in you and he's the hope of glory. And come into agreement with heaven. And hear what the Bible says, because there is a secret to unleashing the power of God in agreement. Hear what the Bible says, And whatsoever, and verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Look at the next verse. And again I say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Look at the next verse. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. You see, releasing the power of heaven is not found in two people agreeing with each other. You know, brother, could you agree with me in prayer? Could you agree with me in prayer? And two brothers come and say, I just want you to come in agreement with me in prayer. That's not the power. The power is not in you two of you only coming in agreement. It's two coming in agreement with heaven. The power is in an agreement with heaven. That you begin to agree with heaven. And I tell you, when you walk in your life where you agree with heaven, anything that you ask God, he will do it. Because he says, there am I in your midst. I'm walking hand in hand with you. And that's what you want for your life. You have been listening to the Ministry of Champion Dynamics International. We would love to hear how this ministry has been impacting your life. Please email us at impact at championdynamics.org. That is impact at championdynamics.org. You can also find articles and other useful resources at www championdynamics.org Join us next time but until then remember it's by grace that you are saved through faith and not of yourselves it is a gift from God